how many of you, whether in your job, some responsibility at home, young people in your studies, can say that this week you did something and tried your very best? May I see your hands? Now, I'm not seeing a high representation. So let me try again. How many of you can say sincerely that this week you thought about what you had to do and you wanted to produce the best that you can produce and you really tried to produce the best you can produce? May I see your hands? A few more hands. Our passage of scripture in Revelation says to us, that God made a distinction between those who did their best and those who didn't do their best. We're asking the Lord to open our hearts and our minds today, amen? We're asking the Lord to send his Holy Spirit to open our hearts so we can hear his voice. Not just hear with our ears, but to hear truly with our understanding and to hear what he wants to say to us. So we start with the, 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 the word of God in John chapter 1 and verse 1 and 2 and 3. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him and without him nothing was made. That was made in him was life and that life was the light of men he became that light that came into this world that lights every human being that's in this world in the beginning was the word my brothers and my sisters it is the word that brought us here i am privileged that my mother and father discussed having another baby boy at least another child and they ended up with four boys and three girls. I don't know if they planned it that way, but my mother's parents before that had seven. And my father's parents, father's parents before that had 14. Ten boys and four girls. Ten boys, all drunks. One uncle died when he was 28 years of age in a sh on a ship traveling between St. Vincent and Trinidad. I never got to know him, really. My father became a Seventh-day Adventist. He listened to his word of God, and he decided to go to church. He went to church with his cigarettes in his pockets for three years. <laughs> and after three years, he finally dumped the cigarettes and got baptized. It was not long after my father became a Seventh-day Adventist that he actually was made church elder. My father served 33 years consecutively as the first elder of the church. At 71, he said, I'm too old. I don't want to be church elder, any, first elder anymore. And they said, please, and please. And at 72, they begged him again, and he agreed. And at 73... 73, he decided, okay, that's enough. Get a young man <laughs> to fill my place. He didn't take the church eldership anymore, and many folks after that would say, you shouldn't have given it up, because things would change. My father will talk about working hard, men stronger than him, bigger than him. But when they cut bananas, they'll never produce more than he could. And when they dig out a root, he'd have more barrels filled than anybody else. He set as his goal, becoming the best he can be. Our, our title this morning is, Is This the Best You Can Be? Let us bow our heads for prayer. And so, Father, we want to say this morning, you know our lives, Father, you know our history. You know, our attitudes and our perspectives that we bring to life. And you know, Father, that we often don't work to become the best we can be. This morning, Father, let your words open our hearts to see you, our model, our God. 
to see Jesus Christ as a Savior. And when we see you, help us, dear Father, to set goals to reach. What a plan that you guide us to make. We thank in Christ's name. Amen. When I was in elementary school, I didn't try very hard. And I went to high school, and I crammed for exam. Sounds like my story was very much like <laughs> our preacher last week, except that he didn't study at all, and he did very, very poorly. I learned how to get through. And so I got through. In high school, yes, I crammed for exam, and I got through. And uh, there were others. Two ladies in the class who always number one, number two. And my friend Charles and I always shared number three and number four. So I wasn't doing too bad. It was good enough. We went for general certificate of education and I did better than others. Except for this. The only subject I paid attention to was mathematics because I love mathematics. Despite the fact that from the very first, uh, well in the Caribbean we say form. Form 1 to 5 in high, it's high school. Here you have grades, um, is that 9 to 12? And so for mathematics, I did well. I can say that the gift that come to us who are Indians, um, math was not difficult for me. So the exams written by Cambridge University and um, London University, two and a half hour exams, I will do them in one hour. Math came easily. And so when I went for GCE at the end of, um, on the end of high school, we wrote the Cambridge written exams. The first exam was arithmetic, and I picked up the pencil, and my hand was shaking and it shook the entire exam. And then, well, I looked at what I did and I estimated. I would like to get about 56% for all I accomplished. I'm thinking to myself, I can do, I can do these tests for one hour. And the teacher would ask me, well, how did you do? And I said, I got everything right. And he wouldn't even check. He just accepted I got 100%. <laughs> And I'm writing GCE exam, which is the end, end of ex school exam. And my hand is shaking through the entire time. And the max I can get for arithmetic is 56%. For geometry, my best class, which I love very much, in trigon trigonometry, I estimated my max was 53%. And for algebra, my worst of the three mathematics, mathematics I estimated my possibility maximum would be 63%. But here's what happened with every single exam. I'm walking out from the exam room, I'm walking down the street, I have the exam sheet in front of me, and every single answer for every single question just came straight to my mind. I had set in my mind in high school to do a PhD in mathematics. What I learned many years later on is that my father was praying for his first son to become a pastor. <laughs> My father crippled my mathematics in the classroom. <laughs> Every single mathematics exam, my hand was shaking through the entire exam. No shaking for health science, no shaking for geography, no shaking for any subject. But mathematics, my father's prayer crippled me. <laughs> my mother said to me, about three, four year, three years before she died, she said, when you were young, you wanted to be a doctor. And we said to you, we didn't have money to send you to school for eight years. Well, I never stopped reading in the area of health science. And so the Lord put me into places like this. When I worked as a chaplain at Hinsdale Hospital, at Florida Hospital, one of the things I did regularly, if I, and mostly I worked on psych, if I meet someone with a, with a particular diagnosis, I go home and read about it. Be sure that I am fully aware of the issues that surround my patients. It was a common thing working that patients would say to me that you did more for me than the doctors did. And the nurses began to tell me this, and it became a surprise when the physician, I can't say one of the smartest physicians, 
on the um, a Jewish gentleman on psych came to me and said to me, my patients are telling me you're doing more for them than I'm doing for them. <laughs> and he said to me, there's this particular patient, I can't come with a diagnosis for him. Would you please talk with him and help me to have a diagnosis? So I talked with the patient and went back to him and common sense says, I'm not a psychiatrist, he's a psychiatrist. So I gave him my observations. I said to him, I don't have the status to offer diagnosis, but these are my observations. He said, that's sufficient, I know what I diagnose. Physician calls me at home and she says, you know, we have hospitalized Grace five times for, for, um, for suicide. And we have a last situation with her. She took a hammer and she beat up on her legs. She's damaged down to the bone, but no skin break. So she said, I think Grace... And her name is Grace, of all things. I think Grace is self-destructive, not suicidal. She said, I'm thinking that I'd like to leave her at home and treat her at home. So she said, I know you've been speaking with Grace. If you agree with me, I won't hospitalize her. And I said to her, I agree with you. I thought afterwards, this is crazy. She didn't call him the psychiatrist. She called the chaplain to ask the chaplain if the chaplain agrees with her not to hospitalize Grace. So she said, uh, every week you will call her. So she gave my assignment. Every week you call her, every week I will call her, see how she's doing. After six weeks, she called me and she said, Grace is doing much better. Okay, what is it that God has called you to do? And to what extent are you seeking to excel? See, God showed me, and, and I can say to you that in, in college I did the same thing, I crammed for an exam. And I learned that you can't cram, cram Greek for an exam. So <laughs> after that, it forced me to study. I learned later on that the Lord wanted me to do my best. So change the plan. And so before this, I had to push hard to get to 3.0 because I wanted to do a master's degree. So I, I got to it before, before I graduated from college. My brothers and my sisters, I waited until in my 20s to begin to study. Are you following me what I'm saying here? And we had a great testimony last week of someone who just didn't study. But when the time came and he got to know God, he began to put the energy out there. How many of you know that you could cook better? You could sweep better? You can clean better. You can do a better roof than the one you did you last time. You can help somebody better. So Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King, said in one of his great speeches, he said, if you be a chimney sweeper, be the best one you can be. If you must be a cleaner, be the best cleaner you can be. Be the best you can be. I admire listening to Brother Tony this past few weeks talking about a responsibility he was going to take on with a nonprofit organization, charitable organization. And everything he said is that he wanted to produce the very best. Because anything that he produced must be something that's blessed by God. Are you and I settling, brothers and sisters? Settling. Or are we looking at the fact that in the beginning was the word? And the word that comes from my mouth is really, really important. And the thorns for, the thoughts formulated in my brain are very important in terms of deciding to become the best I can be. Are we together? If you teach your children to become the best they can be, they would learn and understand you setting before them a principle. And so in the book of Genesis, God sets out to give us a plan that he formulated. He is God. But although he is God, he took time. Ellen White says in the courts of heaven, there was a committee meeting. Where God planned, not only God, but for the angels. 
The fact that Ellen White says that Lucifer was excluded from the discussion of creating this earth is an indication that God included the angels in the discussion of his plans. And God formulated a plan. And the plan says that in the very beginning, the very first thing that God did was send the Holy Spirit. And what did the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit did not change the structure. It was still not formed. The Holy Spirit did not remove the darkness. It was still dark. The Holy Spirit did not change anything, but the Holy Spirit surrounded the earth with God's presence. The Holy Spirit, the Word of God says in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in front of me, it says the world was empty, it was formless, and it's dark. And the Holy Spirit hovered over the waters. Did the Holy Spirit hover first in America, or the Philippines, or the Caribbean? Did the Holy Spirit first hovered in Europe, in Northern Europe, where the white folks came from? Or from Africa, where some of our black ancestors came from? Is that where the, or did the Holy Spirit just come and wrap the whole earth in a big hug? Somebody say amen. You see, this is how God's presence operates. Because when God does things, God wants to do it at the very, very best. And so when God put a plan in place, God did not move the darkness of the drunkard. He did not move the darkness of the drug addict. He, he hugged the drug addict. Amen. A mother knows when a child is screaming and crying that you ask the child, what's wrong, what's wrong? The child can't give you an answer. The first thing a mother does is hug that baby. Amen? Hug that little kid because the kid is can't answer the question. And so Ellen White says, when we are in trouble and we don't know how to pray, we can't pray because we're too distressed. She says, don't try to pray. Just lay back as, in, as if in the arms of Jesus and let him hold you. Because God placed in a mother's heart the best. I learned as a chaplain a very important principle. When a mother has a child, and sometimes an older person sees you in distress, they'll take your hand, right? And they'll rub your hand. Sometimes on the inside and sometimes on the back. Why does a mother do this? It's very natural. Or sometimes they put their hands around your shoulder and they rub the side right here. It's true, mother. Or sometimes they rub the temple. True, mother. And you know what God did? God made these junctures. They're called them pressure points. They made the junctures on the body. There's a pressure point right here. And one right here. There's one right here when you touch a person's chin. There are a couple right here. But there are lots of them here. And in the feet. And God placed these junctures that you can take away headache easily. There are so many people whose headaches have taken away. And this particular lady, she had a stomach problem. Okay, she had multiple problems. If you... If she takes one medication, she has damage. And she has another medication, it does her good. And she has to take both medication. She's in trouble all the time in her, st in her belly. Headaches, belly ache. 73 year old lady, and I was in chaplain's training at the time, I said to her, after watching for a while, I said to her, do you mind if I give you a foot massage? I was in two, three minutes, her headache was gone, the belly was gone. Because there are certain principles that mothers know naturally. God placed things inside of us to know how to produce the best. Are we, are we hearing this together? God wants us to touch somebody the best we can. And so in the beginning, when God did, what did he do? He touched us. He touched us in a way that's very special. 
And then God said, let there be light. And if you're afraid of the darkness? And if you heard stories that made you afraid of the darkness? <laughs> Sometimes the children grow up in fearing the darkness. Well, darkness is not a great thing for living lives naturally, but when you really just sleep, you better have some darkness, right? And some of our children can't sleep without a light. And some of us adults still can't sleep without the light. In the beginning, God says, let there be light. First thing he did, after surrounding us with a hug, first thing he did, he said, let there be light. This is important, dispel the darkness, because, brothers and sisters, anything you put on the earth would not live if it's darkness. So what does God do? He says, I am the light of the world. And so the first thing he did was place light here. What did God do? Am I the best I can be? When Jesus Christ came to earth, we say we follow his model. So we go and visit people. And we give them Bible studies because Jesus did it. And we find a way to bring healing because Jesus did it. And so we do things. Jesus did not do things because he decided to do things. Jesus Christ did things because that, that's who he was. And that's who he is. Everybody got this? He didn't do something because that's what a mother does. He does those things because that's what a mother's like. Isaiah, a mother may forget her second child, but God will not. You see, the principle is he placed in mothers. Sometimes mothers don't get it because certain things happen to us in the beginning. Are we together? Something's changed. But... God placed inside of mother a principle that existed with him himself. And so when God said, let the waters divide, he was doing something beautiful. And when God said, fish, he knows Brother Robert would love to go fishing, but he didn't give permission then to go fishing. Here's the interesting thing about God's creation. There was no conflict around when God's creation was done. He had earth created, he had Adam and Eve created, but there was no conflict. Anybody read Genesis 1 and 2 saw anything about conflict? There was no fussing with each other. There was no gossiping. Adam did not bad talk his wife, and he didn't bad talk the angels for not doing a good job. True? In the beginning, there was no cancer, and there was no diabetes. Did anybody read anywhere in Genesis 1 and 2 that Adam had a headache? Did anyone read after the creation, and this lady shows up for the first time, that Adam said, I got a headache. <laughs> there was something beautiful in everything that God did. Some people get into the discussion about Adam being created first and cre creating Eve afterwards. And they were discussing the issue of equality, and God is not discussing the question of equality. Because God's plan includes certain basic principles. And I'll mention a couple of them in a minute. Okay, here's what we're discussing. Two weeks ago, when I, meant, when I gave this, uh, the message, I said to you, while it is Mother's Day, I'm introducing us to the principle of stewardship. You see, we get accustomed when we talk about stewardship to think about money. And when we talk about money, we don't give good credit to the mother who does a great stew today. Well, in my wife's case, a great curry. Amen? <laughs> uh, 
I was proud of her a couple of weeks ago, a little more than a couple of weeks ago, but three weeks ago, when she, you know, she, I hope she doesn't mind me say, speak, say this about her. You know, she wanted me to buy a couple of these um, roasts. And I said to her, couldn't you get something better than that for, the, for guests at church? <laughs> what do you want me to do? And I said, you know, it's, it's a good meal to have a roast. And I said, to, well, she knows me already, okay? So she knows that I'm raising this because of the issue of health. And so she said, well, you know, we need some kind of protein. And I said, listen, sweetheart, last week there were four entrees and all four had veggie meat. Okay, you heard me say this before? I'm repeating My wife cooked black beans, and several persons came and asked her, what did you put in your black beans that made it taste so good? I'm not going to give a secret from here that I gave her herself. Okay. Brothers and sisters, when God made Adam and Eve, God was putting together something beautiful. It is not the issue of equality that was in discussion that one came afterwards. God made Adam and he gave him a job. Because he wanted Adam to understand he has to work. And when he works, he does his best. So I'm working at Skokie in a psychiatric facility. And while I'm there, every single staff came to me at some point. They knew I was a chaplain, they knew I was a pastor. And so I was working in psych as a regular staff while I was doing my doctorate. And, and these folks would come to me, but this young man, he came in, he'd freshly finished his degrees, and, and he's really strong and gung-ho, and he knows his business, and he's counseling, and so on. After six months, he came to me, and he said, I have a couple of questions to ask you. And here were his questions. How is it that you can stay so calm when you come to work, and the rest of us look so frazzled? And he said, I'm having a hard time I feel like giving him my job. And I said to him, when I came to this job, I came with the understanding that I can't do everything. And these individuals are responsible for themselves and they have to make decisions. We have 24 beds. And the hospital, because the money-making hospital, have, will have up to 36 patients on that unit. He wants to know why is it that we're understaffed and they know that we have a problem. And I said to him, I don't say anything. I just do the best I can because I have to look out for these young people and I have to look out for the safety of, of staff as well. So I did the best I can. But I also said this to him. When I arrive on the job, before I leave the car, I spent my time in first in prayer. I said, Lord, I'm going there. When I go there, I know who they are, and I know who I am, and I know who you are. So be with me as I work with these people so I can do the very best I can for their safety and for their recovery. When I finish the job, and I go back outside, I get in my car, and before I start the engine, I thank the Lord for his blessing there. Let me go home to my family so I can be a blessing to my family. You see... If we start with prayer, we understand how God does things. Amen? So when God put Adam and Eve here, he already set the things in place. He already made, already made his food. He gave him a job. He wants him to see what it like, it's like to need somebody and to have companionship with somebody. He gave him a wife. And Bill Cosby, he put it this way, he said, when he saw Eve, he was asking the question, why did they call a woman? Bill Cosby said, he said, whoo, man. <laughs> and that's how she became called a woman. God was putting artwork into action. Amen. God wants us to do our best. 
And so, Genesis chapter 1 says this. Brothers and sisters, here's what I'm saying to us here together. God put his best out. He wants to put our best out. And I sent you to Matthew 25 for this reason. There's talents, which we must discuss at some point as part of our stewardship. But here's how God started out. Jesus Christ speaking. Three parables in Matthew 25. A marriage is about to take place. The bride and groom pick the best people. Their best friends, their closest people, to be the bridesmaids. Isn't that a story? Said the time, the wedding is taking place, or the reception, whichever it is, the wedding is taking place in the night. They have to have lights. So they came with the little lamps. Now here's the principle that God is teaching us. God say, when God gave me a mango tree, <laughs> I planted around my little property at least 12 mango trees. And several persons, including my father, says, you can't keep 12 mango trees in this little property. They get become big trees. And I said to them, this is Florida. Winter comes here sometimes. If one dies, I have another one. Well, in that case, I have 11 more. And then when later on my father-in-law says to me, I have five of them in a row, six of them in a row, and they, say, and they said to me, that's too many, too many mango trees, they're close to each other. I said to them, if they're growing and sometimes begin to produce fruit, they're not big mango trees yet. So if one bears 20, another bears 20, another bears 20, I have 60. But if I have only one, I only have 20. Okay, here's what God did. God sets a principle in Matthew, and he says, five young ladies came with enough oil to be there for the wedding. And five young ladies decided, you know what? Just in case, I'll have extra gas in my tank. So in case traffic gets bad, in case there is an accident on the turnpike, and I can't get to a gas station, I better have enough gas in my tank. And so, what happened was, the ladies who had extra oil, they brought a container with some extra oil. I don't know if they had a little bag, they brought an extra purse, but they brought some extra oil. So as time went by, and they fell asleep, and they woke up, and the lights were oil out, poured some other oil in. Principles, isn't it? Okay. Here's the principle of God has given to us. Number one, when God made human beings, God honored the principle of sameness. We are made like him. Human beings are made alike. Men and women are basically the same. We all have heads and feet and eyes, and etc. And then when God made the woman, here's what he did. He made the head a little shorter and a little rounder. He made the shoulders a little narrower the waist smaller, and the hips wider. Not just because she's going to have a woman have a baby, because God is making somebody better looking than a man. <laughs> he has to be attracted, right? <laughs> Amen? <laughs> not just to her good looks, and not, not just a good look to her brains and her, you know, and her planning, but also to her looks, right? Amen? Ask Pastor Brian. He'd tell you yes. Definitely. Okay, so... God was putting together a plan for the whole journey. God didn't plan for you to run out of attraction by the time you married two years. The principle of God is to produce the best. Go to parable number two. Do your best. Go to parable number three, which is the parable of the talents. And what does he do in the parable of the talents? One man who has five abilities because he developed his gifts, doubled. Five cities, ten cities. Five talents, ten talents. Next gentleman who had two, two gifts that he developed into abilities, two cities, four cities. Two talents, four talents. The next one 
a bum. <laughs> he probably had more gifts than one, but he developed only one. And he goes to work, he collects his salary, but he doesn't work. He took the money, put it in the best banking thing, place you can think about, he buried it by his backyard. And the man came back from, you know, the master came back and ten, four, this one, at least you could have put it in the bank for me to get interest. Oh, Lord, you, were, you master, you're a thief. Everybody does know you're a thief. So you collected my salary and didn't increase. Brothers and sisters, God has set the principles here. Amen? Principle of sameness, but he gave the principle of difference. We all are different. And then he gave the principle of compatibility where we all have to work together. Did everybody get this? He gave the concept of oneness. First principle, sameness, we are like God. Second principle, we are all different, but we must know who we are. Third principle, compatibility so we can all work together. There are more than that, okay? But today I'm going to stop. We'll end with Revelation chapter 21. And I'll just make two points as we read this passage of Scripture. Brothers and sisters, towards, to become good stewards, we have to become the best we can be. Amen? Amen? Have I made a point strong enough today? Amen. Okay, Revelation chapter 21. Okay. Did God begin strong? Come on, give me an answer. When God did the creation, did he begin strong? Yes? Come on, give me a better vote than this. When God created the earth, did he begin strong? When he gave Adam and Eve, did he begin strong? Yes! <laughs> okay, how is he going to end it all? Chapter 21, we're going to start at verse 6. He said to me, it is done. Sin is gone. This earth is wiped, redone. Human beings have new bodies. It is done. I am, and you see, the concept of being. Are you doing the best? Are you becoming the best you can be is the question. Is Jesus Christ the best he is? I am the Alpha and the Omega. He can talk. Are you getting what I'm saying here? He can talk. He can talk big. I am the Alpha. I am the Omega. I am the beginning. I am the end. And there's no question about it. Nobody can doubt it. Nobody can place any indentation into God's work. And he says, I am the beginning, I am the end. It is done. Verse 6. And then, <laughs> here's something that's interesting. He who overcomes will inherit all things. And I will be his God, and he'll be my son. Everybody got that piece? He who overcomes will be my son but one talent person but cowardly unbelieving vile murderers you know the first time i, I read this with awareness i asked god why would you put this kind of a junky discussion in the middle of talking about the new earth to me, in my heart, I was contesting this. Why would you put this there, discussing the new Jerusalem and giving us new bodies? But you see, God is talking to us today. Amen? He's telling us he's producing the best, but cowardly, unbelieving, vile murderers, sexually moral, those who practice magic arts, idolaters, liars, they will never produce the same. Brothers and sisters, what's keeping you down? What's keeping you down? What's preventing you from becoming the best you can be? What's preventing me from becoming the best I can be? Now, I know for sure for myself that I have a doctorate, but if I had studied, I probably could have had five. One of the seven angels who had seven bowls 
full of the seven last plagues, put some on the earth and damaged. Serious damage. But God, the holy city, verse 10, he carried me in the spirit and showed me a great mountain, showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down from heaven from God. It shone with the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, hold a second. He didn't say it here, but who's inside that city? Who's inside that city? Who's inside that city? I am. Thank you. I am in that city. Do you agree with me? Do you agree with me? I am in that city. Come on. Could we have 100% agreement this morning that I am in that city? All right, so let's read it. It shone with the glory of God, and its brilliance were like, were like the brilliance of a very precious jewel, like a jasper and crystal, it had 12 gates, etc. Brothers and sisters, here's what we're closing with. God is looking for people who produce their best. God is looking for people who hook up with Jesus Christ so we can become the best we can be. But I can tell you this. We can never become the best we can be without Jesus in the heart. When Jesus Christ hooks up with me, Ellen White says this, and this is the reason why I read Christ Object Lessons, chapter 25. She says this, and this is the closing thought. When the will of man is joined with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. And I thought she was crazy when she wrote that. How could you say anything about a human being that's omnipotent? Impossible. No, I'm not omnipotent. Yes, I can produce the best I can. Yes, I can give my will to God. He hooks up his will with my will. I become omnipotent. To God be the glory.